record. So we are good to go. So good evening, everybody. Uh, once again, how's everybody doing? Good evening. All right. So, um, uh, Elder, can you open us up in prayer, please? Sure. So, God, we come to you this evening. We just praise you. We thank you. We magnify you. We exalt you because you are God. We thank you for watching over us during this day. We thank you for bringing us through hurt, harm, and danger. We thank you for the many blessings that you have provided for us. We ask that you would be with us as we continue to look in the book of Daniel. We ask that you would continue to give pastor words of wisdom, knowledge, and instruction for us to be instructed in your word. We ask that you would bless those that are on the line, those that will get on and open our hearts, minds, and our understanding to receive what thus saith the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So uh, we are in chapter three of the book of Daniel. We finished uh, last week with uh, Daniel interpreting Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Uh, that was the, the big, the big deal. Uh, the king was so disturbed by his dream and none of the wise men of the, the astrologers in his area could tell him what the dream meant. And uh, Daniel uh, prayed with, with his friends, uh, Hananiah, Az Azariah, Mishael, as we better know, know them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And uh, they received revelation from God, not only what the dream was about, uh, but gave him the interpretation of the dream, which nobody else can do. Uh, and then we also saw that with that, Daniel uh, told the... the oh, we got him a full the, beard. Uh, you see, uh, I'm talking beard. about my beard because I can hear you. <laughs> Keep my name out your mouth. <laughs> anyway, uh, the uh, Daniel basically told him everything, told him the dream, which is what the king wanted to know. Don't I'm not going to tell you the dream and then you manufacture an interpretation. If you are so wise, you tell me the dream and then tell me the interpretation. And so we get to the end where he tells him about his dream and how his kingdom was powerful, but is going to fall. And we know that the symbolism stood for Jesus Christ, the rock uh, that was going to destroy all kingdoms. And on uh, earth, we would have a new kingdom uh, headed up by Jesus. Uh, and we end that chapter uh, with two things happening. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar uh, falls down and worships God praises God, and then he also promotes Daniel and his three friends. And so now we get into chapter three, but before we get there, are there, does anybody have any, any thoughts or impressions of what we learned in chapter two and what's coming up in chapter three? Okay, no problem. <laughs> so let us go to the uh, Old Testament. And we are going to go to, oh, I see. Hold on a second. Let me have to make a couple of adjustments here. Okay, y'all still with me? Yes. So now we're going to go to Daniel chapter 3. And Can you guys see my screen? All right, yes, I need now. I need somebody to uh start off reading. Oh. Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its width six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. And King Nebuchadnezzar sent word to gather together the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. 
So the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurer, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces gathered together for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald cried aloud, to you it is commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery in symphony with all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the gold image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. Keep going. So at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the, the horn, flute, harp, and lyre, in symphony with all kinds of music, all the people, nations, and languages fell down and worshiped the gold image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. All right, let's stop there for now. Okay, so we, we, we're basically introduced the next challenge that's clearly about to come and challenge the faith of those who believe and worship God. And they're now challenged on how they're going to govern themselves, where they are, because now it is the law of the land. This, this is you know, essentially an executive order from the president that says, this is what you're supposed to do. I put this up as a monument to me, kind of, uh, you know, people, I'll, never mind, I'll refrain from going down this road. Um, he's erecting this monstrosity and, and he is expecting people to fall down and worship this at a particular given time. He, he could just wake up at a whim and, and cue the musicians. And when the musicians start to play and you hear this music, you're supposed to do this and fall down and worship these guys or worship his statue, which is a representation of him. Uh, do we see any correlation to that in, in our world? Not necessarily particularly about the falling down and worshiping at the sound of music, uh, but the idea of what was expected of the people and particularly for those who worship God. You know, think about it in this context. There is, and, and I am going to qualify this statement before I say it because someone is going to look at it and, and want to label me any particular kind of way because they're, they're uh, angry about something. Uh, but what is something that we do as Americans when music begins to play? No, 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 not dance. Something we do to pay homage to uh, a symbol. Would stand up. Yeah, but I mean, think about this. What we we at at a lot of events, graduations, the sporting events, the band plays a song, and then we star spangled banner, and we stand up and we put our hands over our heart while this this song is being played as we stand the stare at the symbol of the United States, which is the uh, the flag, right? Now, we do this because we're patriotic citizens, but could there be some parallel between this? I mean, what, why, why can't we just stand? Why do we got to put our hands across our heart? Because ultimately, it still harkens back to what we call the Pledge of Allegiance that we used to do every morning in school. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now, some religions have for, foreboden, as they would say, uh, their members from participating in the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, they do not uh, let them or uh, encourage that uh, because they, they don't question their patriotism to the United States, but they see this as something paying tribute to uh, a false god. You guys know what I'm talking about? You know who these people are? I don't. Okay, well, Jehovah's Witnesses do not uh, do the, say the Pledge of Allegiance. They do not recite the Pledge of Allegiance, and they do not uh, participate in the Star-Spangled Banner. 
uh, for for those the religious reasons. They they are taking a stand, and there are people who are not necessarily offended by it. Some are, but the majority are not. Uh, but is there? Do you see this as a little bit of a correlation potentially uh, to what Nebuchadnezzar had set up? He erects this statue that's an symbol of him uh, that they are supposed to pay homage to and worship. Uh, and we stand up and place our hands over our hearts. Now, some people would say, well, we're not worshiping that, but are we? No. Why not? Because we know that it's not our God. We know that's uh, a thing. Okay, now that's perfect. That, that's exactly what I wanted to say. Now put a pin in that. Somebody jot down a note that I was my mom that she said, we repeat that again. We know that's not our God. We know that's not our God. Thank you. So everybody remember those words, because quite frankly, those are the words that we, we, any of us would say, we're all reasonable adults on here, or, and maybe they're not some all adults here, but there is a, 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 a probably a group consensus among the majority of, overwhelming majority of, of Christians that we participate in this out of respect for the nation and because we know that this is not our God. So keep that in mind. Now, here's the next question. Why is the word repeating so in such great detail about the, the music? You notice in, in, in verse seven, so that at the time when the people heard the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, and symphony with all kinds of music. That's not the first time we see that in, that, in those first seven verses, right? Yeah, verse five. Right. right. I mean, do you see any, is there any thought as to why it is repeated? in detail and this is not the, the we'll see it further along as we read the same thing that the the same listing those musicians or the instruments in very great specific detail just food for thought that that's not necessarily uh what we're going to uh, to really need to, to worry about at this point in time so um Let's go on. Somebody re pick up reading at verse eight. Anybody? Verse eight. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and accused the Jews. They spoke and said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery in symphony with all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not paid due regard to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold image which you have set up. Okay, let's stop right there. So we hear in this, in between these verses, set verses 7 through 12, we get the, the repetition of the, the instruments again almost kind of like it's being drilled into our head and drilled into their heads, this repetition. When you hear this, this is what's supposed to happen. When you hear these instruments, this is what's supposed to happen. Now let's talk about these, these cats who, who go to the king, uh, verse 10. You, O king, have made a decree that everyone who hears the sound of these instruments shall fall down and worship your image, and whoever does not fall down uh, shall be cast in the midst of the burn, burning fiery furnace. And then it goes into verse 12. There are certain Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not paid, you, paid due regard to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold image which you have set up. What's up with the snitches? Are they snitching or hating? Both. What are they hating about? And my wife said because they got promoted. 
I agree. I mean, it, let's, let, listen to the words they use. Verse 12, there are certain Jews who you have set over the affairs of the province. Now, see, they didn't just, this is not an issue of, of uh, racism per se, because they're, they're talking about, even though it starts out there are certain Jews, but it names specifically, just so, you, so you'll be clear, King. We're not just talking about the entire race of people. We're talking about them three agitators over there. You set them over the affairs and they don't bow down. What about the people in your life? Have you experienced these people in your life that when God starts moving on your behalf, you find these are the people who are the biggest problems for you? Anybody? You mean jealous? Yeah, I mean, because essentially, keep, keep this in mind, put it in this context. The king in chapter two was bothered, so bothered by this dream that he didn't know what to do. And he was so mad that nobody can do what they said that they could do. He declared that all these wise men, astrologers, and, and people are supposed to be put to death immediately. And Daniel was the one who spoke up, don't, don't kill anybody else. I'm, you know, we'll be able to take care of this. These people have literally owed their lives to Daniel, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. Because if it hadn't been for them, they'd be dead. But here they are because they were obedient to God. God showed them favor. And in their favor, they were elevated. Now these people are jealous. What's up with that? What, why? Why? Do we get jealous when other people experience the goodness of God? Perhaps they felt it should have been them. Yeah, I mean, we know, but I mean, in this particular case, they would have been dead if it hadn't been for them. Yeah, but still, you mentioned the promotion. So I'm looking at this, that looking at it from the point that they're jealous because they didn't get promoted and they're jealous that they did get promoted. Yeah, and but isn't, isn't that it, an even, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Uh, doesn't that tell a story that you mad at me because I get promoted for doing what you couldn't? Now all you could have been promoted if you did what I did, but you didn't do what I did. I right. did this right. and now you mad. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> But haven't we seen this in people? We, we see this in our churches that when uh, uh, everybody's jockeying for, well, you know, at other churches, not our church, but at these no. other churches we've been at, uh, you see these people jockeying for positions of power and authority. You know, I want to be close to the first lady. I want to be close to the pastor. I want to be on the usher board or the steward board. Uh, I want to be the head that was a steward pro tem. All these people are, are vying for these positions to have some kind of authority and then it turns around, uh, this person gets selected, not because they're a friend of someone, but because they're the best suited for the job. And all of a sudden now everybody's mad, looking for stuff to say, looking for things to tear them down, anything to make themselves look better in the eyes of the people. And in this case, to make themselves look better in the eyes of the king. These men saved their lives and yet they are hating on them because they, they number one, did what they couldn't do, and number two, got elevated as a result of doing what they couldn't, even though they owe them their life. And the lesson for us is that there are going to be times that we're going to uh, have people in our lives that are going to benefit in some form or fashion because of the favor shown to us, and then we'll turn around and stab you in the back. No comments from anybody? <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so in, in your own lives that you've experienced, can, can, does anybody have any, any, any feedback on times that they've received favor that was apparent and people were jealous?
Okay. Here's another question. Uh, we know it's four of these dudes, right? Daniel, Hananiah, Azariah, Mishael. Why are these guys only naming the, uh, the three and not Daniel? Hmm. Interesting. This is my, my supposition which may not be accurate, but it sounds logical. And when you understand how people operate and their devious nature to try to make them look bad in the eyes of King Nebuchadnezzar, there's a strategy people have, what do they call it? Uh, divide and conquer. We can't take all of them at one time. So let's focus on these and then we'll go after Daniel later. I mean, after yeah. all, Daniel right. did just was the main one presenting the the uh, the position paper on the interpretation of the dream, right? Right. It, and we do know Daniel was elevated to a, a little higher position than the other three. Mm -hmm. So it's probably not a good idea to come to the king and start talking about his number one boy. But if we could take down these other ones and then cast that doubt, then it'd be easier for us to now take down his, his number one boy because he's already seen, as they said in verse 12, there are certain Jews. Now we can start lumping them all together. Here, we just kind of lump them together and then separate them, said so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And also, you notice, is, I think this is the first time uh, or the second time we see their name listed at, in their Babylonian name and not their Hebrew name. But that's not necessarily a, a big deal. But you, you see what I'm getting at? That that's, if we take down these guys, then that'll make it easier for us to take down Daniel. Right. Does that make sense? Because that's just yeah. my theory. That's my supposition, which, which may or may not be accurate. Mm -hmm. it, it sounds, it sounds, I've never heard it that way, but it sounds, it sounds like it makes sense. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, people get devious when they're trying to cut you down and they can't take, it's kind of like that, that old saying that how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. You can't take the whole elephant at one time, but if you take one bite, you can finish this elephant. So if we split these dudes up and start taking these cats out, then it'd be easier for us to take out Daniel because clearly Daniel is the, uh, yeah, the, the the head or the 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 leader, so to speak. So let's go. Stronger. Huh? Well, he could be the stronger of the it. stronger, Thank right? You. Right. He's yeah. clearly the yeah. That would be a good way to put it. Yeah. All right. Let's go to uh, verse thirteen. Somebody read that. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and fury, gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the gold image which I have set up? Now, if you are ready at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery in symphony with all kinds of music, and you fall down and worship the image which I have made, good. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? Keep going. Oh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this manner. If that is the case, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Thank you. That I like the way you finished uh, verse 18. That, I think this is my favorite verse in this entire book of Daniel. Uh, the conviction of these young men, this, but you know, we're not, we don't have to answer you. And we know our God is going to deliver them to you. But then he says, but if not, let it be known, O King, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship your golden image, which you have set up. We will not bow down 
even if it causes us our death. Now, let's go back to that, what I asked somebody to write down to what my mom said. What did my mom say about the Pledge of Allegiance? We know that's not our God. It's not our God. Now, I was kind of going through, you're, you're looking at where we are right now. The king is, he's mad, right? It says that in rage and fury, gave command to bring them to him in rage and fury. And he's basically said now he's got a, the, it's already, I've already sent out the law. I've made the decree. If you don't do this, you're going to be burned, thrown in the fiery furnace. Now I got these people who I'm trying to keep happy are coming to me, pointing out that the very people who I put in position and promoted are not obeying the rules that I have set up. So now he's got to save face, whether he wants to, to throw them in the fire or not, he's got to, because he's, he's got to save face. Because now, after all, what, is, what kind of king is he going to look like to make a law and then let, it, um, let certain people get away with it? See, I, I was trying not to go down that road, but I got to go down that road. You know, when we see people who get convicted of crimes that, that they have admitted in front of Congress and, and uh, committed several felonies and then the president then goes and gives them pardons. How does that look for a leader? I mean, this is, this is what the king is dealing with. I, I have made a law and you have violated this law. And not only have you violated this law, you have stood right up in here and testified before the Senate hearing committee, uh, uh, the Senate judicial committee and said, you will not obey this law. I mean, this is essentially what it is, right? There's the Senate. You can see those senators standing around. I yield my time to the good gentleman from this, this wherever he's from, or the, the good lady from this place. And they're testifying, and, he's, and they, their testimony to the king or to whoever's in charge said, we have no need to answer. I, we, are, we do not recognize your authority is essentially what they're saying. And even though they're his friends and he promoted them, he can't let, let them go because how is that going to make him look? Clearly, he's more concerned about how he looks than some government, our government officials are concerned with. But they had an opportunity to not die, right? Right. Right. It, and, said, and he said, if you're prepared to do it. So what do you think the prudent thing would be to do? Not as not, don't look and think of it now as a Christian. What do you think the prudent thing to do if you were in in that situation and would like them? They would have bowed down. Right. Because after all, what did my mom say? We know that's not our God. We know that's not our God. You see what where, where we're going with this here? We know this is not our God. So it's okay. Here's a little a list of some of the excuses they could have brought down. We will bow down, but we won't actually worship. Just go through the motion. We'll, we'll bow down and keep going. Uh, we won't become idol worshipers. We'll do this one time, and then we'll ask God for forgiveness. The king has absolute power, and we must obey him because he's the ruler of the land. God will understand. The king appointed us to these positions. He just promoted us. We, we owe it to him. This is a foreign land, so God will excuse us for following the customs of this land. These sound like legit excuses. Here's, here's a couple more. Our ancestors set up idols in God's temple, so this is not, not as bad as that. We're not hurting anybody by bowing down. This is the law. We'll just do it. If we get ourselves killed and somebody else takes our high positions, they won't be able to help the people. As long as I'm able to stay in this position, I'm able to do good. So I'll just bow down to get this over with. That all sounds reasonable and rational, right? No. What is it? Doesn't sound rational because we know the type of God we serve, or it doesn't sound rational because it's just not rational. 
I know I asked that wrong. It doesn't sound rational because you know I set up a trap or because, it's, <laughs> or because it's, it sounds rational. It's not rational because we know what kind of God we serve. We know that's not our God. <laughs> <laughs> Plus, I did set this trap. It sounds rational because you set up a trap. <laughs> He know he did. <laughs> but we, but you see see where this goes. It, see, there are things that we do unconsciously as believers. Uh, it, or no, I'll say as human beings, there are things that we do unconsciously because this is what people do, and we justify it in our minds that you know this is this is okay because this is what we do. I mean, this is after all standing up for the, the Star Spangled Banner is the American way, right? We are Americans and we're living in America. So this is what we're supposed to do. God understands that we're not worshiping this flag and we're not paying homage to a flag. We're, we're, it's a symbol. That's all it is. But if sort of you like really tradition. think, huh? It's sort of like tradition. Tradition. <laughs> and we all know what God said about tradition. He don't care about your tradition. I know. <laughs> yeah. But we have the most dyed in, in the blood Christians that will literally curse you out if you do not stand and cover your heart at the start playing of the Star Spangled Banner. But isn't it interesting though? Like Nebuchadnezzar, the music plays and you're supposed to bow down and worship. And when we go to a sporting event, they tell us, please stand for the playing of the national anthem. And what do we do? We stand, stand up. up and we put our hands over our heart, and the first thing we hear, even if you walk, if you're not even paying attention to the announcer, as soon as you hear those drums start beating, and them horn, dun, 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 the first thing you do, and, and you stop talking, and you're staring at that flag. And we know that part of that, what has been drilled into our heads from the time that we have uh, begun to walk, some of us older folks, is that you pay respect to the flag. And I remember I asked somebody, why do I have to respect the symbol? It's just a symbol. What, that doesn't make a, a difference on my, uh, my priorities or how I feel about being an American. But yet somehow the symbol, uh, this piece of cloth that has several different colors on it has become the symbol of what it means to be an American. And yet we have an America that's divided and has been divided for centuries. And so it really kind of makes, makes me think even more so, what is the symbol of? Talk to some people, it's a symbol of hatred. Talk to other people, it's a symbol of hope. But what is really the symbol of hope that we should be respecting and paying homage to? The word of God. God, God yeah. There, there is no, no question about that. Uh, but it is, it, it, and again, let me, let me qualify this. I'm not telling folks, don't go to a sporting event and not stand up at the national anthem or start going around to a pastor Ron said, I don't have to, uh, to salute the flag. I'm not telling you that. I'm just giving you food for thought to think about what we're doing as believers and does is this something that we should be cognizant of? Because it is very real. We have these young men who were told to pay homage to an image that was a symbol of that nation. This, this gold statue was a symbol of Babylon. I mean, this is what it started out in, in verse one. He made an image of gold whose height was 60, and he set it on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. I mean, he said it right there out. It says in the plain. So that means it's out in the open for everybody to see. Just like we sit the flagpole and raise the flag so everybody can see. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's go. Well, no, wait, there was something I wanted to bring up here. Uh, now. King gets mad, tells him to bow down. They don't make any excuses about this. They don't say that God knows our heart. They don't say we're in a foreign land and we're going to do what the people do. Uh, we know who we are. They just straight out said, no, we're, we're not doing this. And uh, no matter, we don't care, King, if what you do, 
We're not looking for a pardon. We're not looking for anything other than to serve our God and then straight out says it. And we're willing to die because we believe our God will save us. But even if he doesn't, we still will not uh, bow down to this image you set up. What does that say about their conviction to their faith? They had a strong, un, unwavering conviction in God. A completely, complete, resolute, unwavering trust in God. And, and for something so trivial, or at least what we would consider so trivial, because had it been us back there, we would have bowed to got right down on our knees and, and been thinking about something else and talking about, well, we know who we serve. God knows we're, uh, we're not uh, worshiping this, this idol instead of obeying the decree that God has or, or not obeying the decree, but holding strong to our faith that says we will not bow down to anything other than, matter of fact, let's, uh, I'm not gonna pull it up on the screen, but let's go to, well, no, I, that's what I wrote it down. Somebody read Exodus 20, verse 3. Twenty verse three, thou shalt have no other gods before me. All right, that's what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego knew, as Christ or not as Christians, as as Hebrews, they knew what the what the law said. They weren't supposed to have any gods except the Lord God, our Lord God, and Nebuchadnezzar verse wanted them. Huh? The verse four right after that says, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven, graven image. Oh, so, there, you, there you go. But they didn't do it, but Nebuchadnezzar oh. did. Right. <laughs> and but they still, knew, yeah. they knew this was not a, the right thing to do. You will make no graven images, but yet Nebuchadnezzar did this. Now keep in mind, remember we finished chapter two where Nebuchadnezzar bowed down in front of da uh, Daniel, said, your God is the only God and more powerful than any of you guys. He's worshiping God. And now here he is at the start of chapter three, building a statue of gold, even though he had a dream of this statue where he, had the, he was the head of, that was gold. You would think that after I, he, Daniel told him his dream, told him the interpretation of the dream, that the golden head, and then he turns around and go build a gold statue. The last thing I would ever build would be a statue, and it certainly wouldn't have been made of gold. He, he's almost fulfilling prophecy for himself that he's going to build this statue. But he changes from worshiping God to now back to his normal self, just like we are. You know, we, God does something good for us, and we're all holy, and we're happy, and we're waving holy hands and dancing and we're telling everybody about how good God is and two three days later when life gets back to normal and we settle back down to our routine and we're doing the same dirt we were doing before just back to living like pagans and and not doing doing what God wants us to y'all know what I'm talking about everybody gets so quiet when I, I yeah. think I, I feel like I'm stepping on folks folks feet I know what you're talking about <laughs> Out. <laughs> yes. uh, Can we stay out? Yeah, you go ahead. Because <laughs> I do, you know, I'm right there. I'm right there with you. Uh, <laughs> I've, I've been there where, you know, with the Lord God, you know, help, help a brother out. I've been good. I thought I was good. Don't let me suffer the consequences of this. And when it doesn't, then it don't, then I'm, I'm happy and I'm screaming and then a week later, I'm right back to who I was and doing the same old mess. And, you know, then here it comes again. You know, Pastor Ron. Yeah. This, this, this is T here. Uh -huh. Good word tonight. Um, Nebuchadnezzar was, was uh, fascinated with the uh, idea that God had revealed this secret to this particular person. So he was blown away. You know what I'm saying? He, he, he didn't, you know, that was all he needed right there. <laughs> but it took some time to get this statue built. You know what I'm saying? So over time, what we tend to do is kind of like the lepers in the New Testament when they had gotten healed on the way. 
a few of the only one turn back, you know, to say thank you. It's kind of like it only takes a few minutes for people to, you know, go on about their business and forget the miracle. They for, he done forgot already. <laughs> and we, right. just, just like we all do. It took a little time. I mean, you know, it lasts mm-hmm. a couple of good few weeks, a couple of months. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. God is so good. He, ooh, Lord, just, ooh. Don't let it start getting good. You want to get back right. to normal? That's right. You know what I'm saying? That's okay. when it really like, well, it's back to normal now. I can just be myself, you know, because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. now Daniel and him is out in the field. They're not right up around him. He done mm-hmm. gave them some fresh seeds and feel like he done paid his debt for Bon to kill them and all that. So God ain't mad at him no more. He done forgot. Yep. He went yep. right back. Right to the man. same thing that was in him in the first place because that's what's in him but just like you said when we first started this god is very intentional this was all a setup to get god the glory so all of this had to happen he had to come right back full circle to that same mindset you know this is their old deal when he wouldn't let the children of israel go they gotta get hard they have to god has to harden us in a sense to get us, how can we be broken if we if we ain't got have to be broken? Ha, well, you said it. You said it. Um, and it reminds me of it reminds me of nine eleven when everybody was going to church. Everybody was sorrowful. Heart was all heavy, crying, and every same thing she just shared. It's the same thing. We've done the same thing. We do it over and over and over, over again. Over and over, over and I over. Children of Israel. Yeah. So the other thing here, we, we, uh, this fiery furnace, because I was talking to somebody about it and they asked, well, wh- how, how did they just happen to have a furnace? You know, fiery furnace, I mean, who just really has a furnace? Well, keep in mind, you know, here in Babylon, it's probably the capital of the city or the country. Uh, they're building bricks to build the city. And it's just, uh, we, we, I did a sermon on this of the pottery. It's, it's basically a large kiln that they're going to bake the bricks in that they're going to use to, to continue to build buildings and structures in that city. So that's why they, they had a furnace and something that's big enough where they're able to walk in, stack the bricks, walk out and fire it up and then go back in there. And when the bricks are cooled down to remove them uh, and you're not just doing 10 bricks at a time, you're doing a lot of bricks because you're doing a lot of building. Uh, so that was the purpose of why the furnace was there. Uh, we finished at verse 23. I need somebody to pick up. Um, or did we read 23? Stopped at 19. 19, that was it. All right, somebody pick up 19. Then Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury, <laughs> and the expression on his face changed towards Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He spoke and commanded that they heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. Okay, let's stop here for a quick second. So it, you, you see it starts off and it says that he was full of fury and the expression on his face changed, which kind of gives me the impression that he was giving them a chance, that I'm mad that you didn't follow my rules, but I'm going to give you a chance because I like you guys. I promoted you because I like you. Don't let me down. Don't make me have to kill you. But they sit up there in front of everybody, in front of everybody in the whole Senate and Congress together, the House of you just tell everybody, the House of Representatives and, and the Senate, we ain't doing it. Sorry. So now he's mad. It says, and his expression on his face changed towards Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So now go on, uh, the, the elder. And he commanded certain mighty, mighty men of valor who were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their trousers, their turbans, and their other garments and were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's command was so was urgent and the furnace exceedingly hot, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Keep going. 
Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished. Uh, he rose in haste and spoke, saying to his counselors, did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said to the king, true, O king. Look, he answered, I see four men loosed, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the son of God. All right, now let's stop there for a second. Now, uh, well, again, with the, the intentionality of which God gives us this word, so we hear the words written at that, in that last sentence, and the form of the fourth is like the son of God. Where do we hear, or who fits that description, the son of God? Jesus. Jesus. This is, but we're in Daniel. How are we talking about the son of God in Daniel when the son of God doesn't come into the New Testament, which is this, this uh, theologians have, have argued this, but many have come to the conclusion that this was the first image of Jesus we see coming to earth uh, to take care of these three men who were faithful and obedient to God's word. Uh, and so here, and, and the other remarkable part of this is that Nebuchadnezzar is a pagan. He is a pagan who believed in what he believed, his gods, you know, this, or some people would call him animist, some people call him humanist, uh, but he believed in everything except the Lord God, Jehovah. And so now these people who follow Nebuchadnezzar and say, dude, this dude looks like the son of God. What do they know what the son of God looks like? other than the fact that something was so magnificent than what they saw in those flames, that is the only words they can use to describe it. Mm, yes. And so we see he gets mad, he fires up this furnace, he's got this thing roaring so hot that the dudes that approach it perish because it's so hot. And then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are thrown into this thing with all their clothes on. And even specifically, it goes into detail about their clothes. Their coats, their trousers, their turbans, and other garments were cast in the midst of the, uh, the fiery furnace. I mean, this is, he's they're going into detail describing this to us on, on what should happen. Uh, the, it, 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 moves me to a, a point to think about when we demonstrate faith in God on what we can see happen in our lives. It just the, the controversy that exists right now within a lot of pastors is this idea of whether or not we should be having virtual churches or should we still defy the word, the law and have physical church like we used to. And people are going back and forth. And as a matter of fact, you, you will see, in my opinion, a lot of these dudes that are uh, 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 using the Bible to beat each other up over something that's irrelevant. We're supposed to be trying to win souls for Christ. And they're sitting there trying to prove a point to demonstrate, I have more faith in you, so I'm going to have my church. And the other ones, I have more faith in you because I'm trusting God is still going to take care of us even though we're at home. And we can all have faith in God. But they had enough faith, these three men, that said we are going to remain true to our faith, and God rewarded them for that. He blessed them for that. He gave them a miracle that all could see. So here again, we talked about back in chapter one, we talked about it a little bit in chapter two, that God still did not deliver them out of the main situation, which was bondage but he delivered them from a situation they're dealing with while in bondage and for the purpose of demonstrating his power to the world. It, it's almost that whatever situation you find yourself in, you remember everybody, if you guys can't, somebody tell me what my favorite Bible verse is. Romans 8, 28. Thank you, Elder. Romans 8, 28. Because that verse says, and we know that in all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord, those who are called according to his purpose. And when he say that all things are working together for our good, here are these men. I mean, here, think about this. They're in bondage and they're about to be cast into a fiery furnace, bound up 
with all their clothes. And in the immediate situation, somebody would say, how is this working for my good? Right? Right. Think about where you are right now in your life, where we are sheltered in place in our homes. There are people who have lost their houses, people that have lost jobs, family members that have been sick, family members that have died. And you're still going to question, how is this working for my good? Now, I can't answer everybody's question about their situation, but I do know that when I found myself in unwinnable situations, that at the time it seemed like it was no hope and it was coming to an end. And then when in the end, when I can look back, it was like, wow. Now I understand what God was doing and the message that was in that. But here we have in this case, they are facing imminent death, but it was for a purpose not for them, it's for everybody else. Because when they go cast this, these, pe these men into the furnace, they see all these other people dying around them as they're throwing them into the furnace. But in, as they look, they see a fourth person. And then the God who they do not recognize, he said, he is like the son of God. God has revealed himself to pagan folks because of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into the fire, they were able to experience and see God for themselves. And that's hard for us to believe that the bad situations in our lives, or we have to go through some things that we don't like that are painful, that, that hurt, uh, that seem like there's never gonna be an end for the glory of God because we don't want to be used like that. Now we will talk a good game. We will say all day long. I mean, I, everybody remember me saying it. I want, to, I want God to be so proud of me that he could pull out my picture in his wallet to show his friends about that's my boy, Ron Thomas there. Until I started going through some fires and I started thinking, well, you know what? Can I retract that statement? Because this is a little too hot for a brother. I want it to be a little bit more comfortable, easy for me. Mm -hmm. But God does not get glory and comfort. God gets glory in trials. God gets glory in tragedies. God gets glory in pain. Mm -hmm. Because when you emerge from that, matter of fact, let's go to, to Isaiah. Isaiah, what, I wrote that down. Uh, here it is, Isaiah 43, 2. I love this Bible verse. I'm going to just go ahead and read it so you don't have to worry about changing. I, I'm not going to put it up on the screen. Isaiah 43. Yes. And this is parallel exactly what we're seeing with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And now my screen want to act up. Uh, Isaiah 43. Do you have it, Elder? I do. Okay, go ahead and read it. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. Yeah, the, the, the mind just popped up. And, and the New King James translation says, when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. And here we see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego thrown into this fire. And they see a fourth man who the pagans recognize as the son of God. Uh, somebody pick up verse 26 real quick before we wrap up for the night. Mm -hmm. Come on, Gwen. <laughs> yeah, I'm putting you on blast. Turn, take your phone off uh, mute. <laughs> Okay, 26. Then uh, Nebuchadnezzar went near the mouth of the burning, burning fiery furnace and spoke, saying, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Abednego came from the midst of the fire. And the stair traps, administrators, governors, and the king's counselors gathered together, and they saw these men of on whose bodies the fire had no power 
the hair on the heads was not singed, nor were their garments affected, and the smell of the fire was not on them. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angels and discovered his servants who trusted in him, and they have, frust and they have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies, that they should not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree that any people, nation, or language which speaks anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made of ash heaps, or shall be made in ash, ash heap, because there is no what happened? Because there is no God who can deliver like this. Then the king prompted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Okay, so it, we I, I wanted to get through the end of chapter three, but you see here, now we're back to where we were in chapter two again. Something happened, Nebuchadnezzar's amazed, he falls down, he worships God, and we end on verse 30, then king promoted. Here they get a whole nother promotion again. Something else to have the haters hate. What, isn't that something you, you, you get, you do good for God, he promotes you, people try to put you up in a trick bag, and then when you remain faithful, he promotes you again, which sounds good on the surface, but it's probably going to present itself to be another challenge. But think about this as the haters. You as a hater have snitched on, on them because you were jealous and hating on their, their, uh, their favor, and now they got more favor. Isn't that something? Yes. But you notice the difference between how they respond and how we respond to haters. Uh, me and my wife were just talking about this at dinner, that when sometimes you'll, you'll, somebody will say something to you and you'll laugh it off at first because you're not going to pay them any mind till about 30 minutes later it plays up in your head and you start thinking, you know what, I don't believe what that so-and-so just said. And then it becomes one of these things. Now you mad and fuming and then you call them back or text them back. You dirty, blah, 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 blah. As opposed to just keep rolling. I love you, Lord. I did, I did my, my, one of my famous sayings, my wife repeated, I don't mind because you don't matter. Or they say it's mind over matter. I don't mind because you don't matter. But that's not the attitude we typically take. We want to fight fire with fire, even though at first we may let this roll up like water off a duck's back, but we ain't going to let, because we ain't no punk. You ain't about to, to embarrass me. You're not about to disrespect me. You ain't about to snitch on me and not get, uh, be able to feel the, the wrath of my fury coming back. And that's how they were able to stay where they were and receive the blessings of God. But notice, verse 26, he commands them to come out and everybody looks at them and it said the, the fire had, that didn't even have, the fire did not affect them and there was no smell of fire. And when we read Isaiah 43 too, it says, when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burnt, burn, nor shall the flame scorch you. No evidence of fire. The promise that God had made and it's fulfilled with uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But then here he goes. He blessed the name of the Lord in chapter two. And at the end of chapter three, he's blessing the name of the Lord again. Bless the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who sent his angels. Here's the pagan recognizing that God is in control and has power and agents working on his behalf. These are the same agents working on our behalf if we would be obedient to God and let him work on our lives. This, this whole thing we have, and you know in our church, we have been talking about the lack of power in the church today is because we do not trust God enough to let his power be manifest in our lives. We cannot, if we were felt, this is, when it comes time to take a stand for Christ, most of us are gonna fold like a cheap card table. We will bow down, we will stand up, we will kiss the ground, we'll do anything because we'll come back with, you know, we're, we're just going along. This is the tradition, this is what people do. This is, God knows that this is not what we believe as opposed to saying, no, my convictions say that I am not serving nobody but my Lord. 
no, I'm not worshiping any image except my God, period. But we don't get to that place. But Nebuchadnezzar has gotten to the place where he realized that there is only one God. But then he turns around and he makes the same threat to anybody who speaks out against God as the threat he made in chapter two for those who couldn't tell his dream. There's the same thing. If you go back to chapter two, he said, he told those people that if you can't do, uh, tell me what my dream is, your houses will be made an ash heap. You will be cut into pieces and your houses will be made an ash heap. That must be his favorite way of uh, killing folks. But that's kind of how evil people are. They're little like one trick ponies. They keep going back to the same thing. And he goes back to this. Anybody who speaks amiss against God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces and their houses shall be made an ash heap because there is no other God who can deliver like this. The pagan recognizes that deliverance comes from our God. And we are so blind and, and struck with so much of the world and drunk with the wine of the world, we don't even recognize the delivering power that God has for every situation in our lives. That every promise that he has made, that he will fulfill, every word is going to come to pass. And that even at our lowest point of life, when we feel that God has turned our back on us, he is still working on our behalf not to make your life comfortable, but that he will be glorified when he delivers you. It's just a matter of who are you going to choose to follow? What are your, the stance that you're going to take? What, what justify, what excuse are you going to use to justify your behavior? Or are you going to get to this place where, you know what, I'm not making excuses anymore. I'm not bowing down to pressure from my friends or my family or even from this nation. This is not right. I am taking a stand for the Lord. I, I, I love that, that gospel song. It says, stand up if you're on the Lord's side. Mm -hmm. And the funny part is that you'll go to church and when they sing that song, it's an upbeat, up-tempo song, and everybody's up, and some people up on their feet. And then when they get to the stand up, and the whole point is for the people to stand up. But you'll see somebody be sitting there in the pew just, when's this song going to be over? <laughs> I'm ready to go home. <laughs> if I stand up, will that get us out of here earlier? <laughs> some point, we're going to have to take a stand for Christ. I don't know when it's going to be. It might be before this election. It might not be for another 50 years, but at some point, we as individuals are going to have to make a stand for Jesus way before that time. And then collectively as a body of believers, at some point, we are going to have to take a stand. Amen. And it's all working for our good. Uh, does anybody have any... Uh, Closing comments before we uh, wrap this up, because I got to get back to work. All right. No. Okay. That's that's good. We don't have no uh, no closing comments. So we know next week we got to get back. Uh, we're gonna not get back. We're gonna be in in Daniel chapter four, as my wife said. You didn't tell us to read chapter three. And like, well, we finished chapter two. So the natural progression is to read chapter three. So <laughs> read chapter four, everybody, Chantel. <laughs> yeah, she's not giving me the side eye today. She's even laughing at this one. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> Gwen, do you want to pray us out, please? You blasted me again, Reverend. I didn't blast you. I just asked a question. I blasted you about reading. <laughs> okay. Dear God, we thank you this evening for this Bible study. We thank you for the word that was brought forth to us. I pray that everyone on this call, or on this session tonight, will be blessed and that it will bless, they will be blessed by what we've heard tonight. I uh, thank you, Lord, for everyone 
um, everyone's health. I want pray everyone stay safe, be cautious, and we'll see you guys all here next week. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. 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 All right. So, <laughs> you guys uh, take care.